do you react to good news? What would be one of your typical reactions if you, if you receive some good news? Maybe you're excited because finally something you've been hoping for is happening. Maybe you're skeptical, wondering if it's too good to be true. Maybe you're cautious, concerned that something will happen to, to change things. Maybe you're suspicious, thinking that Maybe someone is playing a trick on you. Just like we can react differently to good news, so did the followers of Jesus after his resurrection. Mary Magdalene and the other women who went to the tomb reacted by running to tell the disciples what they had heard and seen. Most of the disciples thought that the, the news of Jesus being raised from the dead was nothing more than an idle tale, a trick or a, or a joke. Peter heard the news from the women and he ran to the tomb to, to see for himself. Seeing the empty tomb and the linen clothes by themselves, he went home. Today we hear how the disciples hid behind locked doors because they were afraid. They were, they were letting the world, rather than the risen Jesus, control their actions and their attitudes. Jesus, though, breaks into their locked up, fearful lives and, and bids them peace, just as he promised he would. This triggers their, their joyful response to the resurrection. Thomas presents a very different response to the reality of the resurrection. He responds not with doubt, as is so often characterized. He responds with definite and concrete conditions for believing. He says, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. This is not an expression of doubt. This is a conditional statement, an if-then statement. It's as if Thomas is saying, if I don't see the mark of the nails in his hands, and if I don't put my finger in the mark of nails and my hand in his side, then I will not believe. So often, we, like Thomas, approach our faith relationship as, as a legal contract in which we seek, we seek to establish the terms by which we will respond with faith if I have historical proof, if I have a sign, if God would do, if Jesus would cure, then, then I will believe in Christ. Then I will know that God exists. Then I will make a commitment of faith. Jesus appeared to his disciples a second time. And this time Thomas was with them. Jesus said, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. At first glance, this response of Jesus to Thomas might lead us to conclude that, to, that Thomas came to faith, came to believe, because Jesus met his conditions. The reality is that according to this passage, Thomas never physically examines or interprets, inspects Jesus' wounds as he claimed he needed to do before he would believe. When we look more closely, when we look more closely at this text, we see that, that Jesus actually gave several commands to Thomas. He says, these commands echoed the conditions that Thomas established. Jesus said, put your finger here. 
See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. The final command, do not doubt but believe, is really not a good translation of the Greek. And it's because of this translation that Thomas gets labeled as a doubter. A better translation, and one that is more fitting with the rest of this passage, would be, do not be unbelieving, but believe. Do not be unbelieving, but believe. In this command, Jesus spoke the proper response to his resurrection into Thomas. And in these words, Thomas is transformed and makes the ultimate confession of faith. My Lord and my God. I don't know about you, but unbelieving and believing live side by side for me. There are some points in my life where believing in the resurrection of Jesus and all its promises is easy. It fits. But then there are other times in my life where it's not so easy. This unbelieving and believing as it sits together can create for us a sense of anxiety. But thanks be to God, it is God who enters into our life and breathes the Holy Spirit who nurtures us in our faith. And the reality is it's not whether or not I believe that's important. It's that Jesus believed. Jesus believed and trusted in his Father to raise him from the dead and to do what God would do to win salvation for us all. Unbelieving and believing, living side by side. So often I hear that as I visit with folks who are approaching the end of life. They worry and wonder, is it really true? Can I really trust that God loves me? As bad as I've been, as awful as I've been, can I really trust that God loves me? While my mother was dying in the last several weeks of her life, I had the opportunity to sit with her one day, and, and she looked at me with her finger wagging, you know, like this, and she says to me, this better be true. This just better be true. And I said, Mom, what are you talking about? And she said, tell me that this is not all a lie. And I said, Mom, what do you mean? And she said, tell me that it really is true that God loves me and that when I die, I will see Jesus. Tell me that it's really true. Tell me pastor that I am, I said, well, let's open up some scripture. And we began to read from Romans chapter 8 and from John and from so many other texts, the promises that Jesus makes to us and that the scriptures tell us. And as she slowly went to sleep, I had the opportunity to go outside and I paced her driveway. I must confess a bit anxious and a little rattled by what had happened. And so I paced the driveway. And as I was walking, this stick, this stick fell out of the tree. You see, I had lifted up my arms to God and I had said to God, don't you make a liar out of me. Don't you tell us that this is just a big joke. Instead, Lord, help us to trust and to rest that what you say is true and that we can trust it. And out of this prayer, this stick lands at my feet. It falls out of a, a big tree that was healthy, was full of growth, and it just landed there in a hard thug on the driveway. I picked it up and looked at it and said, okay, God, what are you telling me? What is it about this stick? And then as I came to 
to think about it some more, I realized that, that God is communicating a message of trust and hope, a message of assurance that, yeah, it's true, and that we can trust it because God is God and we are not. You see, this living in the space between unbelieving and believing is often where we find ourselves as, as people as we struggle with this thing called faith and life and where God is in the midst of suffering and in the midst of pain. But we've been blessed by the Holy Spirit who enlightens us and fills us with peace and who gives us a community that can walk with us so that when I'm struggling, the community is lifting me up. When someone else is going through a difficult time, the community is holding them in prayer. You see, this is why our faith-building groups are, are so important to our life of faith. Very soon, these groups are organizing over the, this week and the next. And their focus, their purpose, is to give us as a congregation opportunities to sit with one another, to share our prayer needs, and to talk about issues and concerns of faith. To help guide these conversations, a discussion guide has been prepared for each week, including today, and so it's out at the Welcome Center. You may pick it up. This discussion guide will, will shape the conversations as each one of us goes deeper into our faith and explores how it is that God surprises us in the midst of unbelief, creating belief. My friends, the appropriate response to the, to the reality of Easter involves being transformed by the word the word which spoke creation into being, the word who is Jesus incarnate, the word whom God raised from the dead. Both times Jesus enters into the locked room, he does so with words of peace. He extends peace to those fearful disciples. He extends peace to the one who set these conditions in order to believe. And my friend, he extends peace to us who struggle to wrap our heads and our hearts around his resurrection. Jesus met the disciples and Thomas right where they were. He didn't chastise them for hiding. He didn't chastise Thomas for setting conditions. Instead, Jesus says, peace be with you. Jesus meets you and I right where we are. He breaks into our locked rooms, our locked minds, our locked hearts, and he extends peace to us. He speaks words of transformation and reconciliation, changing us, guiding us, nurturing us, sustaining us, so that we, like Thomas, can proclaim with all sincerity and boldness, my Lord and my God. My brothers and sisters, as Jesus breathed on the disciples, he breathed the Holy Spirit to them. It empowered them and their belief, and it sent them out to proclaim. We, too, have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit, and it is the Holy Spirit who deepens our faith and who enables us to live as people of peace going forth from this place to proclaim the transforming power of God, to raise Jesus from the dead. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. May we be people of peace who can proclaim this message of reconciliation and transformation in Jesus' name. Amen.